uh, let me again remind you where we stopped. So uh, last thing we've been doing, we've been considering the Lagrangian theory for some fields, and uh, the Lagrangian was supposed to be first order. Then uh, I defined something which uh, I called another current. So uh, Bob has been telling you that this is the wrong notation, and you should write J mu here. I don't like JMU because JMU is like an electric current or something. So I'm not going to, to use this either. <laughs> so, so you tell me what, what should I? Well, so let's maybe settle for, for HMU because this has to do with Hamiltonians or something like that. I never dared to use this dirty word in my lecture, but since Bob did it, then. <laughs> then so, so, OK. <laughs> well, so they, I, I can live with writing h mu. Uh, then to do general relativity or a, a metric, uh, a theory of a metric, we introduced, uh, well, this is general relativity since I'm taking this Lagrangian. So uh, we take a Lagrangian, which is uh, 1 over 16 pi r, which we all know gives normal equations for general relativity and remove a divergence so that this becomes a function of uh, first derivative of the metric. And because it's ugly, if we just do it with partial derivatives, we just introduce a second metric so that everything becomes geometric and covariant. Uh, by the way, I've forgotten a square root here, the g. Uh, and uh, so I have a scalar density, first order, at the price of introducing some extra structure. By the way, in my previous lectures, uh, this G was a space metric, and there was this gothic G, so I'm, uh, uh, which I don't write as an 8, but as a gothic G. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so so, so for, for this formula, this is the gothic G of my previous lectures, right? So, so, so this G here is actually a space-time metric now. And if, moreover, you assume that Lx G bar is zero, then uh, I can calculate these northern charges. And, uh, well, you can always calculate them, but if, moreover, this is zero, then the integral over the surface and the field equations are satisfied, uh, which in this case, say, are vacuum, but the, the result is true with matter fields. Uh, then you get a formula like that. Now, uh, Bob told you this morning that the Noether current doesn't give you energy. Uh, yes and no. Uh, so if you apply this procedure, and you start with this Lagrangian, in which case it's a higher order theory, and you calculate the nether current, you're not going to get the same thing as I did because you're starting from a different Lagrangian and you get something else. And then he has to correct his boundary term to get the energy. If I do this the way I'm doing here, I don't have to correct anything. I get immediately the right thing. Uh, there's nothing uh, mysterious or better or worse uh, in what he's doing or what I'm doing, because at the end, what is important is the boundary conditions. And if you start with what Bob was doing, so start with this, second order, calculate another, another current, which is appropriate in this case, then uh, the boundary conditions for the variations uh, will not be satisfied unless you correct this term to what I have directly. Right? So uh, it turns out that for these boundary conditions, the approach here works better. But uh, if you were working uh, uh, at a finite boundary, neither his approach nor my approach will give you that directly the right formula, you have to work much uh, more, more with the boundary term to understand what you have to do, right? So there's nothing better with this 
uh, except, well, probably, in fact, the calculations are easier in, in Bob's formulation because you don't have to remove all these divergences. So, so maybe there is a, an advantage of going his way. But then you have to do something with the boundary term. So if you go this way, you have the result directly. You don't have to, to think uh, why it's better. Good. So this is a boundary term. And let me just mention that uh, uh, I wrote it, I think, like that uh, last time. Uh, but I changed the order of the indices here. Uh, there's nothing wrong with doing this as long as I don't tell you where u alpha beta is. But uh, if I want to be consistent with the nodes, uh, it's just a question of convention. Uh, if I want to be consistent with my lecture notes, uh, you have to change the order here, right? So, so yesterday I wrote for, so, so, uh, d alpha wedge d beta wedge this. And uh, you can do this, but then you have to change, change the sign here, right? So there's, I didn't write anything wrong, but the formula here is going to consistent with this convention. And if I do this convention, that's the convention with my notes. So maybe it's easier for you just to, to use this one. Good. So I never wrote you the formula for this thing. And it's pretty terrible. It has two parts. It has one part, which is linear. Well, so there are two indices, right? So this tensor, alpha, beta, so alpha, beta. By the way, of course, uh, one way of thinking about this is that this is uh, because you're integrating over a sphere at infinity. That's what I'm interested in. Uh, so in this case, uh, uh, you only have u, uh, I think, with this convention, that's going to be ui0 dsi, where the dsi's will be your space metric. So one of these indices immediately becomes a 0. But, uh, and then you don't have to worry why is this, there are two indices here. Then this is the more usual formula if you want to with a normal vector, right? So ui0 times ni d2s. Uh, good. So there is one part. Everything depends upon x, right? So you have to choose your factor x. And depending upon the vector, you're going to get various things. There's one part which is linear in the vector field. And there is another one which is linear in the derivatives in the vector field. So, so you have this d bar alpha x lambda here, where this d bar derivative is a covariant derivative of the background. So, so, so this is the part which is depends upon the derivatives. And if you're looking at translations, translations are in Minkowski spacetime are covariantly constant, then this term drops out. Okay? So it's your, you get immediately a simplification when uh, you look at translations. Then you can forget this term. Uh, you only have to worry about this one. But then this one is pretty terrible anyway. So it's written here. And I'm not going to check this evening if you remember the formula. So, so that's, yeah, that's a little. Terrible. It's a density as it should because there's a determinant of the background divided by a square root. So this behaves like a square root. Uh, here you have two determinants. So this is a scalar. And this covariant derivative, again, it's a covariant derivative of the background. It was wrong here. That was it. Uh, your H tensor appears as a product here. Uh, but exactly. So this would be here, two gothic Gs here, uh, except that my gothic G was only the metric while your gothic G had a. So and then, yeah, we, we should synchronize notations better next next school. <laughs> Good. Uh, so uh, before. Uh, doing anything with these equations, uh, let me write you some simpler formula for, for this. So now I, I'm a, so this works with any metric g bar. Right? So as I already told you, you can use this to do asymptotically anti de space spacetimes. And in the unlikely event I have some time left at the end of this lecture, I will tell you a little more about them. But let's just do asymptotically flat. and. Uh, Let's just look at the energy momentum. So 
Uh, this is going to be my par paragraph 2.3, I believe. Uh, this would be asymptotic flat, so energy momentum in asymptotically flat space times. AF being asymptotically flat. Uh, so uh, let me start with some alternative formulae, and maybe so that everyone can read what I'm doing. Just move here. So there are, this is pretty terrible, but there are nicer ways uh, to rewrite it. So now assume uh, that the, we have a translational killing vector uh, for the background. Of course, it's not a killing vector for, yes? What did I do wrong? Something mismatched here, right? Yes. Terrible, terrible. Let me just check. What did I do? Uh, oh, there's a G beta gamma floating around. Good, thanks. So there's a G, G beta gamma missing. Okay, so. You have to differentiate this and this index. Thanks a lot. Good. Uh, we assume this. So I'm not going to do the calculation, but there is a much nicer expression. So uh, let me write it like that. Uh, first, this, is, uh, this term is gone, so I get a something which is linear in x. So the numbers which come with it are going to call p mu, x mu. And uh, so this is the same as the Hamiltonian or this another charge um, here. And I'm in three dimensions. You can do it in any dimensions, but I, let me just don't bother about, uh, about con yeah, well, these expressions are, there are analogous expressions in higher dimensions. So this is always the space-time metric now. Uh, so you're going to tell me, well, why is this any better? Just write it like that. Just to It's still terrible. Uh, let me just see if I have the indices, right? So, so, so if you just want to think ab about p mu, right, so just forget this, right? And then you have the formula for p mu. So uh, integral of as, in, as, in, as infinity, you take a sphere pass to the limit. This is the epsilon. Uh, tensor with the square root that g factor in. So, so that, that's a density. So lambda is contracted here. Gamma is not contracted, so this doesn't look good. The mu, nu, alpha, yeah, the one, one of them should be beta, right? So, to, so it's probably a beta. You just... Um, Uh, that, yeah, that's a gamma here. Yeah. Right, so now everything looks to be contracted. Whether it's correct is another issue, but at least, yeah. Good, okay, so is it better? It's a little better somehow, well, there are these some anti-symmetrizations and, and stuff like that. These anti-symmetrizations are, of course, taken by putting an epsilon here. Uh, and then you can replace this by gammas. Uh, what I have gained is an integration by part cute formula, which I think was uh, first noticed by Ashtekar. 
you can integrate things by parts here, and you're going to get uh, x mu x uh, well, I should probably uh, x nu x mu r nu mu alpha beta square root the g and I'm back with my forms s alpha beta here but this one is much nicer so this is an integration by parts uh, this is still my vector x which was constant in an uh, Asymptotic in Kafkian coordinates, and here I, I have introduced the position vector. Right, so the position vector is something which is completely not geometric. It comes with the coordinates. Well, we're not shocked because this was not geometric, so that's uh, that's not uh, astonishing. However, this looks already much more geometric than the previous one because it doesn't use uh, the Christoffels, which transform in a terrible way but a Riemann tensor, we transform it in a nice way, okay? So this is a much cooler formula. Yeah. This is the Riemann tensor. This is the Riemann tensor, right? the curvature tensor. And so the way you, you get this formula is you know, you, you write your Riemann tensor in terms of derivative of Christoffels, integrate by parts, and uh, by integration by part, this axis will disappear. You'll get this. This is capital X. This is the same vector as here. And this is the position vector, right? So this is the coordinate, right? So x mu is really t, x, y, z. Right? So this is not geometric at all. Putting an x is not a geometric thing to do. Good, but, but so, so that's the formula. Uh, you can replace it by the Weil tensor if you want to, because uh, I've assumed vacuum. And if you don't assume vacuum, you assume that the matter fields decay fast. And therefore, any contribution from the matter fields from the Ricci tensor here will have to be zero. Otherwise, these integrals don't converge. Right, so I'm going to come back to the question of convergence of these integrals and stuff a little later, but uh, let me just first show you the formal formula. So this is uh, this one is from a direct calculation. This one is a lot of jungling with gammas and derivatives and stuff. This is integration by parts. There is a cute formula in the term of uh, in terms of the Cauchy problem. So, because uh, if I'm working on a surface t equals zero, I can decompose uh, the Riemann tensor, so the R of the space time metric, space time metric, so I need a hint more space, R nu mu alpha beta of the space time metric. And if I just take the space indices, Space time metric is equal the Riemann tensor of the, and I don't want to use a different symbol, I could, but of the space metric plus uh, k square terms. So, well, uh, if you want to, I can even write what they are. It's Maybe. <laughs> well, I know roughly up to sign what they are. So if you are happy with up to sign, then it's for A I K A J A minus A K I L K J K. And with a little chance, maybe it's even correct. I think it's correct. So, uh, So, so, so uh, you're integrating at t equals zero. So uh, at t equals zero, this will be zero. So only the space part here will, will enter in this formula if you just work it out. And uh, moreover, uh, if you think about what we've been assuming before, that kij is O of R 
minus 1 minus alpha, with alpha is larger than 1 half, then these k square terms are O of R minus 2 minus 2 alpha, which is, which is slower than R to minus 3. And uh, if you look at this formula, you have a position vector which behaves like R. You have an area coming from the integration, which is R square. So this gives you, this gives you an R. Area gives you an R square. This is a constant. So, so you get a R3 multiplying things which are little of R3, I mean, I minus 3. So this will go give no contribution, right? So no contribution. So you can go ahead and put in, rather than putting the space-time uh, curvature tensor, you can put in the space curvature tensor. Now, in three dimensions, the space curvature tensor can be expressed by the Ricci tensor of the space metric. So I'm not going to do the calculation, but if you continue, if you do this, so insert this in there and use the fact that Riemann is Ricci in three dimension, you get a, another cute formula, which is minus 1, 8 over pi, integral s infinity, the trace-free part of the space reaching, right? space reaching tensor. Uh, xi ds, uh, xj. Yes. Okay. So that's, uh, I think, the, the coolest formula I know for the ADM mass. And uh, that's the one I, I think what everybody should use, right? So rather than writing this terrible formula in, the, in terms of partial derivatives, they have a nice formula in terms of the Ricci tensor of the space metric with a non-geometric object, which is the, uh, this vector. Well, you can make it kind of geometric by saying that this vector uh, is a conformal killing vector of the background. So uh, the, 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 the xj corresponds to a dilation. It generates dilations. It's a conformal transformation of the flat metric. So you could, rather writing a, a component, you can write it as a zj vector. Z, z is x j dj in asymptotically flat coordinates. This is a dilation vector in, uh, in, in the background. So that's good. So this is, uh, these are the formulae that you get. And now the question is, uh, in any case, does all this converge? And what about conservation laws now? So, uh, conservation and we'll come to Lorentz invariance later. Uh, I will discuss maybe again at the end uh, angular momentum and center of mass. But I think it's more important that in my lectures I tell you something about the trotman bondi mass than keep discussing ADM. So I'll talk about conservation now very quickly uh, and then uh, go to Troutman Bondi mass, and maybe at the end come back to angular momentum center of mass if we have time. So, conservation of energy momentum. Uh, well, before you talk about conservation, you should ask uh, is it well defined at all? Right? So, so first question well defined. Uh, by the way, so uh, this is, uh, I'm finally able to uh, answer a question that somebody asked uh, my first lecture, actually, you did. Uh, is this mass? Is this energy? What's the business here? Well, so now here I have a four vector, right? So this is my energy momentum vector. This is the P mu. And the mass is actually the zero component of it. Okay. 
So mass is not really mass. It's energy. Right? So if you've done elementary uh, special relativity, the zero component of the energy momentum vector is not the mass. The mass is the square, right? So the mass is actually, so this is a very bad notation. I mean, well, actually, the mass should be uh, square root of uh, minus p mu p mu. This is the invariant mass coming with an uh, energy momentum vector. So this component is energy, right? So what people call mass is actually energy. Uh, of course, if you're doing only uh, the Riemannian problem, so positive scalar curvature and you want a number, it seems silly to talk about something else than the mass. But at the end, this m is actually a component of a four vector, and it's not the mass, it's the energy, and the whole thing, if you get to mass, you have to know that this vector is time-like, otherwise you'll get a complex number, and that's part of the positive energy theorem, right? so you have to, to work a little. So this vector is time-like, so minus p mu p mu is actually positive, and its square root is what is the mass. Uh, good, so well-defined. Well, to do this, we'll just do, do, we'll do the usual uh, assumption, well, a similar assumption to what I did before, but not on the uh, space metric, but on the whole space-time metric. So, uh, so uh, we, we, and then the time derivatives, right? But now all derivatives, not only the space, but but also time derivatives have to go to zero faster than uh, right. So then the d sigma of t mu nu is going to be O of r minus alpha minus one. Uh, well, how do I check convergence of this integral? Well, I'm going to use the uh, Gauss theorem again because this u was coming from this h mu. Actually, h mu is probably, with my conventions here, is probably the divergence of u mu. Uh, uh, like that. And h mu was, is here, right? So this is a quadratic expression, uh, is a quadratic expression in the derivatives. Uh, when the field equations are satisfied. So let us think about vacuum. Field equations are satisfied. Uh, if you remember in, uh, in the uh, Cauchy problem case, we had this condition that this integral should be finite. Uh, but but this had two parts. One was coming from, well, if you rem the scalar constraint equation is telling you that R is 16 pi matter density plus K square minus trace K square. Don't ask me where lambda is. Lambda is gone. This is lambda equals zero. So uh, K square will have finite integral because our alpha will be, of course, larger than one half. Uh, so, so this condition, since I'm in vacuum, I don't have to worry about, uh, about what, what this does. Right? So if I had some matter fields, I would need to assume something about matter fields. But let's just do vacuum, just not to be bothered. So, uh, so therefore, integral of at the infinity of u mu alpha uh, say uh, ds mu alpha. There's probably uh, some factors involved like two, but it's an inter integral of a sigma of an expression quadratic in, in the derivatives. And now here in all derivatives, I don't make any difference between time derivative or space, right? Everything was kind of completely symmetric on those. So derivatives so this should be quadratic in derivatives. 
but derivatives fall off like one alpha minus one, so I get, it's exactly the same calculation that I was doing before uh, d3x, and so this is finite if and only if alpha is larger than one half. So this one half is just showing up again exactly in the same matter, manner. Uh, these integrals exist. But uh, I get a little more just from this calculation, namely if I take a domain like this, so sigma is uh, t equal t1, and here sigma is t equal 0, or maybe c okay, t equal t1, then I can use the divergence theorem between this surface and this surface. Right? So I have that uh, integral of u alpha beta ds alpha beta on uh, d sigma 1, and this is d sigma 0. plus the divergence, and therefore integral over this tau surface of something which is quadratic in dg. Right? Quadratic in dg. Well, what does my tau surface do? Well, there is a, it, it has a radius, and so therefore the integral over this will have a contribution r square from the radius. Uh, and an integral in time, but the integral in time is finite, right? So I get uh, the quadratic thing in dg gives me uh, r to minus 2 minus 2 alpha. And uh, if I, I have a plus 2 coming from the radius, so this is r minus 2 alpha. Obviously goes to 0 as, alpha, as r goes to infinity. And you think, well, maybe that's so. So I'm wasting a lot of powers here, right? So because alpha was, in fact, this integral here would go to 0 even if alpha was anything positive, right? So, but of course, you, you cannot have alpha smaller than 1 half because otherwise the integrals wouldn't make sense. So you need this, but you also see that there's a lot of room here. And what, is, what can you do with this room? You can boost your surface. Right? So, so in this calculation, when you pass with the radius to infinity, you're going to get that the Hamiltonian uh, of sigma 1 is equal the same as the Hamiltonian of x at sigma 0. Right? So that's how you get conservation of energy and momentum by this formula. Uh, but because you have a lot of room here, you have a power of R uh, for free, what you can do is you can boost your initial data surface. So let me try to, to do this in a 3D way. So this is your initial surface, and you boost it in space-time, so t, and you make a boost in this direction. So if you boost, you're going to get a surface which looks like that. So this is your sigma 1 now. This is your sigma 0. And you can use the divergence theorem on this surface. Right? So this is now your tau. So if you're integrating over tau now, what has changed? Well, we're still going to infinity with the radius, right? So you're still going to get an R square from the area of the surfaces. But if you boost, uh, you get a linear graph. Therefore, this distance will be growing up like r. So the integral here, it's still the same formula, quadratic in dg. So the, 
quadratic in dg gives you minus 2 minus 2 alpha. The area of the spheres gives you plus 2. But you get an extra plus 1 because this goes far in the future. So you get a plus 1, but you're still good. Right? Because you get still goes to 0 because my alpha is 1 half. Right? So this alpha 1 half magic actually guarantees that this thing, which is just a bunch of number at this stage, is actually a four vector under boost. It's a Lorentz four vector under boosts of your initial data surface. Okay? So the conclusion is x. So p mu behaves like a boost, uh, behaves like a Lorentz vector or covector. under boosts. Good. So this is a basic, yes? Wait, 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 wait. Can you derive alpha being greater than half just by demanding that energy is conserved? Energy would be conserved with alpha positive. You don't need one half, but it wouldn't be defined. <laughs> so having something which is conserved but not defined. Right? Because we needed alpha larger than one half for these integrals to converge, right? So that the integrals might not exist. And we know that uh, uh, we know that uh, this is sharp. Uh, I, this is, I said something before which I'm going to uh, last time, but I'm going to repeat. So P0 is actually the ADM mass, right? So it's the same as ADM. If you just do the calculation, if you assume all these fall-off rates, right, We're assuming alpha louder than one half, and pi is the something called the uh, ADM momentum, and there is a formula for this, which is um, integral uh, over yes one over eight pi integral at the sphere at infinity using this kij tensor, so k delta ij minus uh, minus kij dsj. Okay, so this is the ADM momentum, and we know that it exists by just what I said before. Good, so uh, as I said, maybe, just maybe, we'll go back, we'll come back to mass and center of mass a little later. But at this stage, let's go to the uh, Bondi form, Troutman Bondi mass. So, uh, I just showed you that the AD mass is conserved, but then you should be worried because we believe that there is gravitational radiation. So, how, how, how is this compatible? And, and the argument is trivial, right? I can go as far as I want in the future three times the lifetime of the universe, if the universe was asymptotically flat, uh, you'll still have the same total mass, right? In this argument, there's no, way, no room for problems. So what is the uh, why, how possibly can energy be radiated? It has to do with this condition here. This condition is a condition on the asymptotics of the metric if I go to infinity along space-like slices. Now, if you know anything about wave equations, uh, then there is a, a, a standard fact that if you have in Minkowski space-time box phi is equal zero, then 
at large distances. So this is Minkowski, large distances and large times. The field, suppose you start with uh, compactly supported data. Uh, of course, if you start with stupid data, then everything can happen. But suppose that you start with initial data which are supported in a compact set, so both phi and the initial derivative, then these fields propagate. Uh, there's no issue about the behavior in the space directions. Just by finite speed of propagation, the, if you started with compactly supported initial data, then uh, the field will be zero outside this domain of influence of this region here. So if you go to infinity at constant t slices, no matter how late, the field will be zero at some stage, right? So, so this kind of behavior at, in time like, in space-like directions, will be obvious. It's going to be zero, right? So certainly faster than any power you want if you put a scalar field here. But if you go to infinity in these directions, this will not be true anymore. And you can actually prove something like that, that this is going to be a function of u where u is t minus r and angles divided by r plus lower order terms. And in fact, uh, r minus 2, I think, with the setup here, if I start with smooth data. Right? So if I go to infinity in space directions, I can assume whatever I want for the decay. But if I go to infinity, Along null directions, I got a decay which is 1 over r, which is good. That's the kind of thing I wanted. If you take the angular de derivative, uh, so So, so, of course, d theta of phi or, d, or, or dxa, so let me write xa is theta phi. Then dA phi will be, well, this function d, uh, dA psi over r plus O of r minus 2 again. And du phi will be or dt phi will be dt psi over r, or du psi, right, over plus o over r minus 2. And dr phi, well, if you differentiate with respect to r this term, you get one, pi, how, one power more. But here, r enters also here, so you get minus du psi over r plus o of r minus 2, right? So the derivatives don't want to go faster to 0 than the other ones. Uh, that's a fact of life. And uh, because Einstein equations have a wave character, that's what I was trying to explain you at some stage, then this is the behavior you expect to have in these metrics. And uh, therefore, these naive calculations that uh, derivatives follow faster, just don't work anymore. I mean, the formulae are still there. They're still correct. But the behavior of all these integrands is much more delicate. So you have to sit down and work uh, several times harder to uh, obtain the asymptotic behavior of these things. So uh, the first one to, uh, to attempt this in a systematic way was Andrzej Troutman in 58, uh, who, who got the right formula for the mass in the gradation regime, and who proved the uh, mass loss formula in his formalism. So one thing he didn't have, he didn't have a nice geometric framework to describe this, and Bondi was the first one to do this. So Bondi. Uh, introduced to study this, this kind of behavior. He said, well, <laughs> because obviously the 
what is important is this null direction, so this uh, going to infinity along null directions. So let's try to use coordinates which are adapted to null hypersurfaces. Okay, so, so use coordinates adapted to null hypersurfaces. And his propo proposal was, well, why don't you write the metric in this form, the space-time metric, so G00 du square. Well, this one, actually, he had a name for this, EUDR plus GAB D, DXA uh, R square. So he's put R square HAB DXA plus UA DU DXB plus UB DU. So these are called Bondi coordinates. So uh, let's see uh, what's special about this metric. Uh, there's something missing here. There is plus zero times dr square. Right? You don't see any dr squares here. And you don't see any, what's missing? dr dxa probably, right? Plus zero dr dxa. Uh, good. So I, I take any metric locally, I can certainly, well, actually certainly write it like down like that, just changing some coordinates. Here the point is that these coordinates should not be local, they should have a local character, right? So you should be able to go with R uh, R larger than R, and so you can go with R to infinity as far as you want. Now, because this, vec this is a zero here, this means that G over dr, dr is zero. So the vector D over dr, which normally you think of it as being a nice radial vector in Minkowski space-time in normal coordinates. Here is a null vector. So this is actually, this is wrong, right? So this is not my dr. This is dr, right? So dr looks like that. Now, r is constant to the surfaces, so you should think of the surfaces as, as light cones. An example would be Minkowski metric, where you go to u is equal to t minus r, right? So just take eta is minus dt square plus the usual story. And I replace t, so I get minus du plus dr. square plus dr square plus r square d omega square. And so the dr square cancels out, right? So, and you're left with minus u square plus minus 2 du dr plus r square d omega square. So this is an example of Bondi coordinate system, right? So G00 is minus one. Beta is, uh, let me put a minus here. Beta is zero. Uh, the, this metric HAB is just the round metric on the sphere. And UA is zero, right? So you think, well, 
If this is a model, good model in Minkowski space-time, and I want to go to infinity in a space-time which was asymptotically flat, so maybe this should be actually a good model in general, at least for large distances. And uh, so why don't we try? Uh, so what can we say about the asymptotics now? So if this is the model, then G00 should go to uh, to minus one, so this is minus one, and uh, I am going to anticipate here, there will be corrections terms, plus little o of r minus two, All right? So this is going to be my g zero zero. That's not obvious that it works, and actually uh, this is something you have to to work out. Let's see, you probably don't want to see this formula anymore. I don't think we never, uh, we ever wanted to see this anyway. So what, what about HAB? Well, HAB, if this is supposed to be something resembling Minkowski large distances, this should go to the round metric uh, on a sphere, which it just depends upon angles. And maybe there is a term H1 of uxa. So this is coming from my experience with the wave equation, right? So this would be some kind of the equivalent of this wave field. And there will be lower order terms. Uh, what else? This function beta should go to, uh, to zero. So beta should, be, uh, should go to zero. In fact, if you calculate it using Einstein equations, so let me anticipate the formula, and then uh, I will explain you where it's coming from. Well, let me just write it like that. If you, uh, so you have a function of angles and time over R square plus lower order terms. And UA, well, in the model case, UA is zero, so it should be going to zero, so it should be, uh, well, just uh, UA one over of U and XA divided by R plus little o of R. Minus one. Okay, so so that's the Bondi's ansatz. Actually, it's a little more complicated than this. Yes. Yes. Yeah. In this in this coordinate system, the vector the vector dr is no, right? If you calculate it in this metric, it's no. Yeah. Right, yeah, so here it's not. But so dr, good. This is called, uh, uh, Nick, Nick Woodhouse called this the fundamental confusion of analysis. Uh, when you change coordinates, vectors change directions. Right? So if you, yeah, if I want it to be, yeah, what, what happens with vector d over dr in this case, right? So how does it work? So we start with coordinates tr xa, and we go to coordinates u r xa. So if I want it to be uh, perfectly clean, I put me, let me put it R bar here, and this bar I'm going to remove, but R is R bar, and X A is X bar A, right? And then if you calculate D over DR, in the new coordinate system, then it's D over DR bar, right? Then this is uh, the, uh, 
How does it work? <laughs> D uh, over du, du over dr. No, d over d, 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 t over dr bar plus d over d r, dr over dr bar. And because d, t over dr bar is non zero, right, because t is u plus r, the vector d over dr bar, which, as every good physicist, you call r <laughs> again. Right. So, so yeah. So the this would have been the proper way to do it, but uh, nobody does that in physics. Right. So, so the, this ve vector changed directions all of a sudden because you decided to change coordinates, which sounds stupid because if you just change to a different coordinate system, it's going to change again. Right. So, but uh, yeah, that's what it does. Uh, good. So. So this is uh, this coordinate system. So you should think of you really being a null hypersurface, but it's not only a null hypersurface in Minkowski spacetime. It's really a null hypersurface, right? So uh, it, it's null with respect to the real metric. And if, yes? If somebody has uh, ever read uh, Troutman's paper about this, this is what is missing in Troutman's paper. Troutman doesn't have an insight to really look at real null hypersurfaces. He looks at asymptotically null hypersurfaces, which works as well, but it doesn't give us such a clean picture. So what is the, the time-like or space-like character of the U coordinate? Uh, the level set of U are null hypersurfaces. And the way to see that these are null hypersurfaces is that this famous vector, which is d over dr and not d over dr bar, uh, is perpendicular, right? So, so if you calculate the scalar product of du, uh, well, dxa, dA, and dr, then this is g uh, ra, and this is 0, right? So dr is proportional to itself, because it has zero lengths. It's proportional to the xa's. So if you add a surface xa equal constant, it's proportional, it's orthogonal to all directions on this surface. So it's a null, that's the definition of a null hypersurface. Good. Uh, so if I wanted to explain this to you, I would need to open a new section called the characteristic Cauchy problem, uh, which I will not do. Uh, but let me just uh, sketch very, very shortly and informally. I hope it's not going to collapse. Uh, how does this work? So I've already, somebody asked before, how does it work, uh, the characteristic Cauchy problem? And uh, my answer was, you can, specify freely the tensor induced by the space-time metric on your hypersurface, okay? So here, the hypersurface is u equals zero. It's a characteristic surface, it's a null surface. And the characteristic Cauchy problem is you specify in any way you want this tensor induced on the surface. Well, what is the tensor induced on the surface? You just say, take this and set u equal constant, right? So u equals zero or u equal constant. So this is gone, this is gone, this is gone, this is gone. So the induced tensor is, is this. So these are actually the characteristic initial data here. And you don't have to copy this or note this. Uh, it's just uh, very loose. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I just want to give you an idea how this works. Good. And then now you have the characteristic initial data. But you know that Einstein equations are wave equations for all components of the metric. And that's what you want to solve. Uh, so you need to, out of these things, calculate all components. All components being this function beta, this function g0, 0. zero this vector ua. And this you do uh, using part of the 
it's very similar to the constraint equations uh, yeah, on space-like hypersurfaces, except much easier. Because the constraint equations on non-hypersurfaces are equations which are terrible. Here, if you write them out, these are ODEs along uh, these geodesic directions. So you have something which is called constraint equations here, but you can solve them by integrating along geodesics. So these are second order ODEs. Well, they're PDEs, but somehow you solve them by integrating along this direction. And therefore, once you're given this, uh, and for example like that, you're free to do this, because this is completely free. So once you've given this, you solve the characteristic constraint equations, and you're going to get what I wrote here. Okay? So you get this, where this is a free integration function. If you want, well, well or, or this is determined by some global, global properties. So if M is a global function, whatever this means, a called a mass aspect. So you get this by integrating the equations. So this form of beta, you get it by integrating the equations, and this form of u, you get it by integrating this equation. So once you have decided how this looks like, everything else is determined. Okay, so this is a fact of life that you can admit. Let me tell you another fact of life. Uh, so Bondi was suggesting that you can use these equations to, to solve the characteristic problem. And uh, no. So these equations, if you write down Einstein equations for space-time metric, which has this form everywhere, you'll get a system of equations which doesn't have any good PDE properties. So this is similar. So there is a, a PDE problem, which is similar to something I already mentioned. If you try to solve the space-time metric in a coordinate system, which looks like that, this is not a characteristic Cauchy problem, but the normal one, then no. You can do it for analytic data, maybe, but that's it. I mean, you, can, you cannot, there's no well-posed system known to humanity at this stage of evolution of humanity which would give you directly that this is a well-posed problem for smooth initial data, right? But you, you know, on the other hand, that you can take this as initial data, solve in uh, harmonic coordinates. Once you have your solution harmonic coordinates, you can transform to these coordinates, right? So this is, this is exactly the same here. Uh, you can start with initial data in bond form, solve in harmonic coordinates, and then transform to uh, a form where this is everywhere true. Okay? But if you want to do this on a computer, good luck. I mean, you're going to waste time, and you're going to have a code which crashes. If you want just to solve this, that's experience of nowadays humanity. That's what happens if you try to do uh, Cauchy, uh, to solve these equations in this coordinate system. Good. But what does this have to do with? Uh, mass and, uh, and so forth. Well, so you take the metric here. Uh, you, put in, you put everything here in this terrible formula. And you go to infinity with r, but uh, not in this direction, because we know already what happens in this direction. But you go to infinity along light cones. Right? So now you take integrals over fixed r, and you pass to the limit uh, with infinity. And that's what you're going to get is first something called the Bondi uh, mass. So Bondi mass, which is integral, which I'm going to call Trotman Bondi mass. <laughs> it is 1 over, oh gosh, yeah, it's probably 1 over 4 pi. Integral of this mass aspect function theta phi over the angles, so xa d2xa, over a sphere, 
right? So the sphere is in infinity because I, I've passed to the limit and I'm only keeping this factor here. You'll get the uh, Troutman Bondi, so TB is for Troutman Bondi. Uh, you get a Troutman Bondi momentum, which is a similar integral. It's really funny, right? It's just not clear how to get this, but that's what you'll get. Well, this here is just the position vector. So you think of this sphere S2 as being the, uh, what you think it is in R3, right? So vectors of length one in R3. Then this is, you integrate this mass aspect function against the function x or the function y or the function z restricted to the unit sphere, right? So in other words, cos theta or sine theta cos phi or sine theta sine phi. Uh, if you want to think in terms of intrinsic quantities, you integrate against the first non-trivial uh, eigenfunction of the Laplacian of the sphere. Because cos theta is actually the first. You calculate Laplace of cos theta on the sphere, you're going to get some coefficient time cos theta and, and so forth. So if you don't want to think about embedding, there are three functions which span the L equal one harmonics on the sphere and integrate against this. And so the, uh, good, that's a definition. And the reason why people uh, would have been keen to give a Nobel Prize to to Bondi when they were giving a Nobel Prize to Weiss and uh, other people, if Bondi still lived. Uh, uh, by the way, a colleague from Vienna, about uh, well, a time ago. Uh, then uh, this is this Maslow's formula, which says that energy can only be radiated away. And the formula is that uh, D m over du, right? So m depends upon this retarded time. Here, and there's a coefficient which I certainly don't remember. So it's minus 1 over 32p, an integral over s2 of this coefficient dh1 uh, u xa. Uh, right, so there should be indices, by the way. Right, so the, this is a tensor in a sphere. You take its norm. So you take this coefficient of the expansion of the metric, take its time derivative. Uh, you get a tensor of the sphere, take its square, integrate it, and this is uh, obviously smaller than zero because of this minus sign here. So this is the Bondi mass formula. Where does it come from? Well, it just comes from uh, taking, doing this exactly what I did previously, right? You just take two uh, surfaces which go to infinity and uh, you make an energy balance, energy at sigma two minus energy at sigma zero is equal to this flux and this flux is, is this, okay, with a minus sign. So this formula was first discovered not in this notation, but a slightly different notation by Troutman in 58. Uh, there's a interesting story that Troutman went to London. He gave a series of lectures on that. And uh, Bondi wrote his paper two years later. Uh, which is fine, of course, and uh, he had this new way of doing this, but it would have been fair to quote Troutman, who, who gave lectures that he attended to. But Good, so this is the Troutman Bondi story. Uh, how am I doing with time? Five minutes, okay, good. So uh, what can I tell you in five minutes? Well, I can tell you that, uh, well, it's been fun to Vector here. Uh, I hope you, you've learned new things. Uh, I certainly enjoyed lecturing to you and uh, interacting with many of you and uh, 
the weather and the swimming. And so have a nice conference. I regret I can't stay next week. I have to go back to Vienna, but uh, it was fun being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you.